Hello everyone, I am the Synodic Scribe, and today I'm not alone. I have reached into the Aether to pull some of my friends and fellow lore nerds to my side this time. Today I am joined by Stout Helm, the Ezalim Collate, and Final Fantasy XIV Fun Facts from Twitter. I speak to all of these lovely individuals about the world of Final Fantasy XIV all the time, and today we're making you a part of that discussion. Today, our topic is the state of lore in Final Fantasy XIV. Be sure to let us know your thoughts in the comment section below, and we hope you enjoy. So before I get this ball rolling too hard, uh, let us go around to the table and tell everyone a bit about yourselves if they're not already familiar. Hey, thanks. Uh, I'm Stout or Stout Helm on YouTube. Uh, I like to do uh, deep dives, particularly into characters, but also explore uh, lore questions and theories and things that people generally like to talk about. Uh, I'm a Gunbreaker main, and people always say my glamours are either cool or it takes them totally out of the experience, like this one I'm wearing right now. All right. Hi, I am uh Final Fantasy 14 fun facts. I run the Twitter account. I just tweet out really interesting things that I find about the game, whether it's, you know, from the stories or from the floor books or quests and that sort of stuff. Um, looking to expand in the future, but, you know, I'm always there to chat and discover new things about 14. Nice. Uh, my name is Crow Toen. I run a channel known as the SM Collate on YouTube and on Twitch. And I've basically just been playing Final Fantasy XIV for a long time, done a bunch of random stuff here and there uh, with the lore, talking about it and stuff like that. It, there's a lot. <laughs> but yeah, just uh, glad to be here, and thanks for the invitation. And thank all, all three of you for joining me today. Honestly, if this video does well, I would love to see if we can't get more people involved. I always enjoy talking to... Uh, the Orzian Archives. I would love to get uh, Chronicler of Lore in here. People like that. It's always fun to talk about lore with like fellow lore nerds and stuff like that. So, without further ado, let's get on with the topic that has brought us all together here today. And that is the state of lore in Final Fantasy XIV. We are in a state that is unique and interesting as far as Final Fantasy XIV is concerned. We've not been in a state like this because we've been experiencing the story of Hydaelyn, Zodiac, and their saga for the past decade. And now that it's over, we're kind of like in this dip between this, the end of a huge story and maybe the start of a new one. So how does, let's start off by just getting everyone's general impressions about the story from start to finish, what they all like enjoyed or didn't enjoy. And whoever wants to go first, just go ahead. I'll go first, I guess. Go for it. Um, so I, I think Endwalker is on the whole, I think is a really strong expansion in terms of storytelling. Uh, the initial 6.0 run, which, you know, is, is from start to finish is, you know, pretty much a self-contained story. Uh, but for the most part, it's a really good one. We have a lot of, great emotional moments in certain locations, uh, things that really make you feel uh, deep feelings, tug at the heartstrings, uh, get you emotionally invested to the events that are happening to these characters. Uh, and I think there were a lot of big payoff moments for a story that's been constructed over the course of 10 years. Uh, and in particular, uh, I think some of the moments on uh, Ultima Thule are really good. I think uh, the entire Garlean story is fantastic. Um, and I think that all that stuff self-contained is, is really, really strong. Um, there is some intrigue with what kind of happens after Afterwards, 6.1 and beyond. Um, there's a, you know, zero is an interesting concept. There's mystery surrounding Golbez, but like you mentioned, it's largely a, a self contained uh, story that's been disconnected from everything else that's going on. And there's pros and cons that go along with that. Um, but on the whole, you know, the initial story we got, like the finale, I guess we want to talk about it in that way. The finale of the big story uh, is really good. And overall, I'm pretty happy with this expansion and what we've gotten so far. All righty, uh, I'll go. I'm generally about that same. Uh, I'm relatively positive about it all. Um, obviously, there's going to be holes. So there's going to be things patching up. It's a 10 year long story. There's going to be gaps in not only people's interpretations, but also gaps in 
uh, I guess, the author's interpretations, you know, how they try and tie things back together. Um, but in terms of a, a finale for the story, I definitely was positive of it. Uh, I, I really liked what was presented in terms of 6.0. Um, a lot of the stories that people did or didn't do, um, you can see sort of finalized at the end there. And I think that it works really well. Um, but in this context of us going forward, uh, we always have to look back on towards, uh, I guess, 2.0, 2.1, 2.2, um, that sort of, those sort of patches. And what happens there is it's sort of a lull, a catch up. We're trying to fix any sort of broken holes or trying to patch out certain things that people may or may not have uh, experienced. Uh, so I can see that sort of settling on people differently. Uh, but for me, I'm just sort of excited in where we go. A lot of the story we have yet to experience, we've yet to experience a lot of the different locales and different people. Um, for instance, I mean, with the Relic Step, we go back to an ARR NPC, um, and we, we're going to learn more about them. Uh, so I'm just sort of excited. I'm sort of in the, the back seat here, sort of experiencing things and ready to see where we, uh, where we go. Yeah, I, I enjoyed Ned Walker. I think it was a really good, it, for me at least, uh, heavy nostalgia because you know they they had the multiple references towards you know, previous expansions with Heaven's Void and and Stormblood, and you know I started I think I started Final Fantasy fourteen right before three point one, so I was like kind of smack dab in the middle of it, and so anytime they make references to Heaven's Void or Stormblood, I get really excited because those are the ones I'm most familiar with, and yeah, I really enjoyed the 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 way they capped it was was really nice. I mean, I feel like that there's and I've I've read a lot of stuff. People have been saying they should have done it this way or they shouldn't have finished it this way. But we're talking about something that probably hasn't been done before in terms of a live service game, and that's you know, ending the story in the first place. Because the idea of the live service game is to keep this going for as long as possible. But they were able to, you know, give permission i guess to a conclusion and that's that's something that's really cool with endwalker is seeing being able to wrap this all up in this one nice little tidy package and then continue on with what we've been seeing since 6.1 6.2 6.3 is you know the start of a new story and yeah i i had i enjoyed it a lot i enjoyed being able to finally i i think what that you know thavnir and and charlayan have been areas that people have known about for a long time. They've been mentioned since 1.0. We finally get to go see these places. We finally get to see what they were all about, and that was super cool. Uh, being able to see, uh, finally go to these places and 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 close that out, and hopefully get to see more in the future of of, of these areas. Because hopefully get people... to see more, as in finally uncloud Ilsabard. Yeah, <laughs> you absolute <laughs> cowards! Uncloud uh... Ilsabard already. <laughs> <laughs> There's, there, that, that is such a big, you know, and every single time I look at the map, I don't know if I get angrier or if I just get like, like, I've just noticed details where I'm like, you, you could have done this like sooner. I, I don't know why there's still a big cloud on this thing. Oh and you know, we're able to like, see like, it from like, space, but no, <laughs> let's cloud Ilsabard still. Good God. Right. It's, it's, it's very, very uh, unfortunate side of it. Whoever's in the map department, we're just we're just asking very politely with strong words. We're like, not asking for a world map. We're just asking that you uncloud Ilsebard. Come on, man. There's right. got to be somebody. Biggest there continent. Can, there has to a, be a who's complete Who's seen map. it and can... Yeah. Where are the, the key car cartographers when we need them? Right. I mean, the I Iron Hearts. We just pay the Iron Hearts, you know? <laughs> I remember when uh, uh, when Shadowbringers was was coming out, and it was I think like first or second trailer, and we saw the Crystal Tower for the first time, and I was like, oh no, no way are we going to another shard? I mean, we still haven't removed the clouds yet, and so that's just been a meme <laughs> with my friends and I, where you know we go to another dimension uh, for all things. Um, and while Shadowbringers is amazing, I can you know I can go on a tangent about that. Um, but it's still funny where it's like you know I've been talking about removing the uh, removing the clouds since was it 2018 ish. Um, so at this point we're on year five and the clouds are still there and it's like I just need one strong gust of wind, please, uh, yeah. to, to remove the clouds there just so we can see the underbelly. No, of yeah, what, okay. What so actually... ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> you heard it here first from the lore nerds of Final Fantasy 14. 
The clouds over Ilsebard stopped making sense since Shadowbringers, okay? No, they, they, they added, because, I mean, I think, like, personally for me, the moment they mentioned Bosia as a nation, and they showed, like, I mean, we knew about Bosia since 1.0, but the moment they mentioned where it was, that should have been mm-hmm. uncovered, right? Mm-hmm. And then there was an entire series about Werelit, which is also in Ilsebard. When they mentioned Werelit, they should have uncovered that. At that point, like, what is left? And they just yeah. kept going. And <laughs> exactly. <laughs> names and then when at. Endwalker <laughs> finally comes out, they uncloud some of the map, and all we get is Dalmasca. Yeah. Are you know kidding who, me? <laughs> yeah. I don't know who needs to get who needs to get that card in the mail. That somebody in the Square Enix offices <laughs> needs to open it up, where it's like, it's okay. It's okay to show it. Just, just do it. Just, just, just do it. it. We won't what, tell. Like what? What could it possibly contain that is worth hanging on to for this long? I'll go to the Final Fantasy XIV fan fest this year. I'll bum rush the stage and demand Yoshi P <laughs> <laughs> to uncover the map. <laughs> yes, please, uh, please go viral. I want to read a story about crazed fan charges. Some the stage. idiot wearing robes Yoshi and a mask started visibly uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> Koji Fox is fr- is afraid. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh, man. And then there's a channel upload on yours the next day, so I was kicked out of FanFest. So Fest. I'm no longer available at FanFest, guys, <laughs> but I did get a cease and desist order from Yoshi P. <laughs> oh, man. But in that case, I'll provide my, I suppose, take on the Endwalker and the finality of Final Fantasy XIV's main story. For the most part, I am in agreement with all three of you. It's tough when you're doing studio writing like this because this isn't like writing a book this isn't like a novel where one person is working on the whole thing from start to finish and it's one complete idea in a studio like this you have not just the head writer but other supplementary writers and then you have like the quest writers too like it's complicated and then you won't have the same expansion writer from expansion to expansion So trying to keep all of these people essentially on the same page and in the same mindset is hard, as you can see with other MMOs like World of Warcraft. But I feel like for the most part, they did a spectacular job, I guess, staying on track, staying on topic, and getting us to the end. Do I feel like they could have taken their time with some more parts in Endwalker? Yeah, of course. But honestly, I feel like that's more hindsight because when the Silence of the Seventh Dawn finally disbanded and the Warrior of Light was essentially being told like, oh, well, why not return to your adventuring roots? I thought to myself, well, excellent. This is the perfect excuse slash avenue for the Warrior of Light to kind of detach themselves from their titles, their name, and even people they know in order to go to new places and meet new people. And then we, less than a pa- one, very next patch, we're right back to the friends that we've been traveling with for 10 years. We're right back to saving the world from another uh, crazy thing. And I'm like, okay. So we got through Endwalker, disbanded the Scions, opened all these doors to go right back to same old, same old. But that's just me. I think Zero uh, needs to go back to Hot Topic with all that hat tipping she does, but hey. <laughs> okay, the hat tip. I will back you up. The hat tipping is excessive. I didn't mind it in uh, the first patch that she appeared in, but 6.3 was so excessive. Like, the first time, it's like, oh, okay. It's, it's like, oh, cute. And then it happens again. It's more. like, <laughs> all right, kind of kind of wearing out your welcome a little bit. But um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I tend to agree with you. Um, and I... I'm, and maybe I'm wrong, but I think some of the story beats that we've taken are possibly a sign of things to come. And there could be some apprehension with, you know, there are some fans who really want to see a, a big departure from what we've been doing. And I'm kind of one of them. Like, I would be okay with wiping the slate clean and the adventurer setting off with maybe one or two people that they know. And for the most part, fleshing out a new cast of companions that accompany the warrior with whatever it is they're doing, wherever they go. Um, I think that would be really refreshing. I think it would be a lot of fun, but I would understand if there's some apprehension behind the development team to say, we're going to shelve these characters that people 
love so much. Um, and so I think probably what we're going to see is a rotating, like some of the scions will like rotate in and some of them will rotate out. So it's like, they're never really going to truly be gone. It's just going to be whoever's not busy at the time. And that's for me, that's kind of disappointing because some of these characters have had arcs and I think it's okay to leave them behind for a while, but I don't know that that's what we're going to get. I feel like they may be testing the waters to see can we get away with rotating these scions and the fans not lose their mind because the band's not together like they have been. You see, I am in agreement with that. Like, I wouldn't be mad, like, if maybe one of the scions comes in now and then to help us with something. Like, that's totally fine. But I would be disappointed if, like, at the very end of such a climactic and fulfilling story that they didn't take advantage of this rare opportunity in storytelling to go nuts, just go out into the world, try new things, experience new places, new cultures. And like, this is, like I said, the window is open for anything to happen. Please, Fall Fantasy 14 writing team, please take advantage of the window. <laughs> I agree. As someone that comes from, uh, from a handful of MMOs, ironically not WoW, but uh, I did play Guild Wars 2 for a handful of years. And the original, uh, I'll, I'll you know save the story short, but uh, the original squad that you have at the end of the story, at the end of the main story, you end up getting a new set of squad. Um, and as far as I'm aware, you're still with them today. But you did get a new set, uh, a new crew, right? Um, and and that allowed for a different perspective, different uh, avenue for going through things as well. Um, and so while I do enjoy the current cast of characters. While I absolutely love Yastola and Graha, and especially Graha with this expansion. Um, Everyone's favorite I, boyfriend. Yes. He, <laughs> he, he, definitely, he definitely grew on me, and I really appreciate what they've done with him. Um, but I do see uh, just Square Enix's um, you know, lack of want to go in a direction away from them just because they've invested so much into them. You know, it's a 10 year story. So while I see, yes, it's 10 years, we can go off of them. It's also, it's been 10 years. Why not keep going with them? It's, it's a, it's a mixed bag. Um, but I would like to see just new characters in general. So, you know, while Varshan is great, while zero is great, I still think we have plenty of room and time, um, for more, you know, back in a realm reborn, how many characters did we know by 2.3, let's say, right? You know, we got a couple. We got Yugiri Tees, right? Um, and, and we just kept on getting more between A Realm Reborn, Heaven's Word, Stormblood, etc. So I, I generally do think we've got plenty of time um, to get more characters. And I do like what we have now. I just am ready to see more. I didn't realize how much of a disappointment apparently there was in Yugiri's initial, like, reveal. Apparently that was an entire stinker that I just didn't see uh, yeah, yeah it's a lot of it's been so long since i've gone through it i don't even know if i remember thinking of it as a negative a lot of people expected you know viera they said you know yeah people thought the things on the side of her head were ears um and so they expected viera um and then you know we got ray and people said oh they look relatively human there was a whole disappointment about how uh, our raw look, you know, as an our raw enjoyer, I'm not going to sit here and and go into that. But you, got, you will not time, tolerate this our raw slander. I, I will <laughs> not. Uh, I've always enjoyed uh, Yugiri in, in terms of you know design and implementation um, at the beginning of her story arc, and I and I liked what we did with her at the beginning. Um, but at the same time, I I do remember a lot of negativity. Um, just around, I guess, the, the, the scaly boys in general, um, you know. But, yeah, that's just... People are always going to be disappointed about every little thing. We all know that as, as lore yeah. aficionados. Yeah, you're, um, there, there's gonna never going to be a reality in which everyone is satisfied. There's always Absolutely. going to be a group or person yep. or whatever that's like, no, this is awful. And yeah. I oh. feel bad for those people. And mind like you, you said not... a second ago, you were like, Graha's everybody's favorite boy. And I mean, like, it yeah. should be obvious that he is. But from the video I did, there were people in the comments like, I don't know why anybody likes this guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, there, there are always some people who are. How oh dare like, he be supportive it, and friendly? <laughs> I know. How how dare he? Um, 
but yeah, so you're not going to make everybody happy all the time, but I think you have to have that willingness, you know, to tell a story and to take risks and they've done it before. We've seen right. it, you know, several times where they've done, you know, they've taken some unconventional story beats and in my opinion, it really works. And that's part of the game's charm. I just don't want them to get gun shy because they're worried that people will say, well, where are the twins? I really need the twins. Or where's Yustola? Or I don't think anybody's going to go, where's Estinian? Even though I love him to death, I think we can uh, take, I think you can take a break. Estinian's a hard character for me. Just, you know, the quiet brooding type is always something my brother liked. And I sort of just admired for being cool, but never really loved. Um, but Estinian, I, I really like with the what they're doing with him in terms of humanization of him, you know, uh, exposing his his full government name, you know, at the beginning of the Charlene arc there. Yeah, um, that was really cool. Uh, seeing more of a, you know, how he's really bad with money, how uh, he's getting know, more how... character the more you hang out with him. Yeah, exactly. They've... And I, and I, and I exactly. think that's a really good strength that they're doing, you know, just the walking around with NPC. They do that with every MSQ patch. Um, and what they do with that is, you know, for us, we're able to look at the dialogue. And but, but even for people that ignore dialogue, that ignore story, you just seeing that you are forced to walk around with X character is still something, and they at least are able to remember that. Mm -hmm. And I and I appreciate the 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 devs for doing that. That addition to Endwalker was actually amazing. Just walking around with NPCs and, and hearing them talk. Yeah, yeah. That and I'm glad dope. you brought that up too, because there's you know there's merit in saying, well, you know, because Estinian's a great example because his big arc was several expansions ago in Heavensward, but you get mm -hmm. these little bitty moments that continue to develop him in a meaningful way um, without upstaging anybody else. Um, I loved uh, his team up with Gaius uh, and all these other little bitty moments that show us more about what makes him tick. And I know people are all like, oh, he's a big dumb guy with a spear. But, you know, they give us little bitty nuggets here and there. And I think they can continue to do that. Um, I just want to see it with a new cast. Right. I, um, I have a genuine appreciation for that character in particular due to the, the short stories that they release every year. The, the, short, the short stories that are written by the, the scenario developers. The ones that know, are on the website? Had, yeah, the one on the website. Yeah, uh, I they, love those. They, they did one with Estinian a while back. I think it was... I want to say it was Stormblood when, you know, he, he wasn't, yes, active, it was. Yeah. He wasn't an active player in the Stormblood quest line, right? Like you saw him maybe twice throughout the entire MSQ. And then there's that short story that kind of filled in the blanks of where, what he was doing in between those two show, show moments where he showed up in the MSQ. And then you, you learn about the whole thing where he was mourning, like he, like he, he went to go tell Ratatosker that the war was over and all this stuff. And I was just like, absolutely mind blown with the level of you know just complexity that they put towards him because you know how he's explained that it's not just him anymore but he's also experiencing nidhogg's uh feelings and nidhogg's uh you know his connection with the dragons is because of nidhogg's residual ether in his body and all that stuff and i'm just like well this this is this is came from this all developed from an npc that was part of a a job right like this like that was it like it was he was an NPC in a job, and he turned into this well-rounded character with all these very various plot points, various you know in influences throughout the story. And I'm like, yes, keep doing that. Do that with other characters, you know. <laughs> like, <laughs> as much as I love Astinian, you can do this with other characters. Let's learn more about the ninjas, right? Let's learn more about because you know I think Obero showed up once in Stormblood, mm -hmm. and and they never explained why, or they they never even talked about it. <laughs> It's like you see He's him in the cutscene, but He's no one there. acknowledges that <laughs> Obero was actually there to help. And and I'm like, I would love to see him in the MSQ, right? Like like, or I would love to see some other. Thing. And it doesn't even have to be job NPCs, right? Like knowing how long people have played this game, or at least a, a large amount of the player base who have played this game, there will be someone who'll point it out and be like, oh hey, that's so and so from this quest line, you know? And then people can be like, oh, you know? And then everyone gets together and has that exciting moment of you know connecting the, the lines yeah they did such a good job with the stinian so i want to see if they can do that with other characters from the other npc or from the other storylines other side quests and things like that meanwhile you know, I, that... yashtola is one note is all get up I, I, yeah. about to say, I, I agree there i mean when when you look at i mean that's sort of why my account exists is hey look at this random thing you might have missed right, um, right. one example is uh Yumitra, right i mean that's Yustola's oh, 
you actual sister. physical sister. And a lot of people yeah. either A, forgot about that, B, didn't pay attention to it, or, or C, <laughs> never knew about it in the first place because they've Until just they Until they saw it in the MSQ and they're like, wait a minute, that's her yeah. sister? <laughs> Yeah, right. and and you know you have the whole family, and obviously I you know I don't expect the devs sit there and make you know the whole family tree for Yastola, but at the same time going in on you know who Yamitra is, why she's dealing with you know the summoners and whatnot, uh, you know the sons of of Saint Koinak and all that sort of stuff, you know mm-hmm. you especially with us going into the the deep dungeon currently, uh, you know there's room to do all this. Do I expect all of that? No, but will I be very surprised and say? Hey, you guys should go do the summoner quest at least up to level thirty. That'd be great, um, and, and you know it allows people <laughs> to experience more of the game that I'm always rooting for. You know, there's actually a member of the Y Tribe hanging out in uh, Old Charlian that is probably one of Yastola's uh, brothers. Wow, I had no idea. I actually, have not finished the Charlian side quest. That sounds amazing. Yeah, he's awesome. just in the yeah. hall pondering something. I forget what he says, but it distinctly says he's a member of the white uh, tribe so there's that about that but yeah yastola has experienced little to no character development or I'm mad character no changes she... meanwhile the she... stinian's grown up and honestly uh one of the characters i thought had the biggest like 180s was alphano like he went oh, from right. this obnoxious yeah self-righteous <laughs> child me and every time he was in a cutscene i was just like who left this baby here but then like throughout heaven's word he grows up he realizes oh i still have a lot to learn and that's okay and he went from being a snotty little prick to one of my favorite characters in the entire MSQ. Watching him right. throw himself into the ocean during Stormblood was one of the highlights. <laughs> but no. As a character-driven story, Final Fantasy XIV is amazing. Because, right. like, like we've just established, there are so many fun and likable characters in this game. And we get to see how they react to certain things, how they grow, mature, and etc. Mm-hmm. So amazing. And that's kind of why I want to see what other kind of characters and what other kind of things we may be able to see in the future. If we, because as we've just said, some of these characters have already completed their big arcs and so everything. Mm-hmm. So, if and it's we, okay to, it's okay to bench characters. Um, like, you know, it's in, and, and I'm not saying that there's not stories that can be told with these characters because they've proven time and time again that they can. I think Gaius is one of the best examples. They took a really, uh, you know, a somewhat flat villain uh, and they really fleshed him out with that raid series and made him into somebody that you can really understand. Very complex, very deep. Such a good um, raid series. And I think, and they can do that again. Um, I just think mm-hmm. they just need to, you know, it's okay to also say, we're going to set this character aside for a little bit and explore like, do we really uh, like? And, and I know we're probably going to get Kryle. They've said we're going to Kryle's going to stick around, and she's one of the ones that's been on the back burner. So if we're going to bring any Scion, bring Kryle, hundred percent. Right. Um, but like Thancred's had a, Thancred has had an arc. I am not a fan of of Thancred for the most part, but he's he's had an arc. He's had an <laughs> identifiable arc. I think he can take a break. He's had um, multiple. I don't want to have another. Exp- he has. I don't want another expansion of him just existing to. Uh, to throw quips at Uriange. <laughs> like, I think he, he can take a break for a little bit. Um, but yeah, like there were characters in Endwalker that were introduced that, that had that, um, that had that depth and that charm. I mean, who played, I say who played, there's going to be somebody in the comments that says, I didn't like this, but who didn't play and just really get captivated by Matsuya? Um, and a lot of other characters oh, yeah. in this expansion who, yeah. who have a lot of charm and quirks and, you know, somebody you can really resonate with on, you know, several different levels, uh, and give us more of that, like pick a small cast of people to go with us to Maricidia because I'm, I'm calling it. That's where we're going. And, uh, and <laughs> um, all of those characters and, so eager to grope the Azure Dragoon, no. like those NPCs <laughs> had more character in one cutscene than some characters throughout an entire expansion. And that's, it's a shame because it's like, it, no. you see that stuff and you realize, Oh, they know what they're doing. Why don't we see more of it? Or it makes you want to see more of it. I suppose I should say. Yes, it does. 100%. 
But um, it's funny you bring up Kryl, because that's actually another one of the topics that I wanted to go over uh, today. Uh, we've talked about how the story for Final Fantasy XIV has ended, more or less, and is starting over again. We've talked about how wonderful the characters are in this game. However, the state of the lore, not everything has remained consistent. Now, like I said earlier, you're not going to have the same writer from expansion to expansion. And since there's multiple mm -hmm. writers in a studio, not everyone is going to be 100% on the same page 100% of the time. It's impossible. There are going to be continuity errors. There's going to be things that fall through the cracks. That's okay. But, as lore fans and lore channels, most of us, we see and sort of giggle when we see these things, don't we? Mm -hmm. We kind of sit there and go like, oh, they might have forgotten about that. We didn't, though. And <laughs> it's funny you bring up Kryl, because that's something that I was uh, wishing for more of that never happened. And that is the Echo. The Echo was built up up until, I think it was Stormblood, it suddenly fell off in Shadowbringers, where, like, it was built up as this really important, like, power that not people, a lot of people knew about. You had the students of Aldessian that had an entire contingent dedicated to studying it, and all this other stuff, only for the Echo to suddenly kind of just evaporate out of thin air, and only... Like, let us see in the past once or twice during the MSQ in Endwalker. And then, like, the one of the biggest uh, traits the uh, Echo had, the immunity to tempering, was suddenly given oh, yeah. to the Blessing of Light mm -hmm. out of nowhere. And that was confusing. So I would like to get uh, y'all's opinions on stuff like that. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll go through first, um, just because my opinion is not too heavy for or against it. Um, but more or less, uh, uh, I, I think of the Echo uh, and the Blessing of Light, uh, they both kind of get conflated at times, especially as we go throughout the story. We sort of just chalk it up to, oh, the main character is superpower, right? Um, and so while it's two different things uh, uh, sort of working parallel to each other, always helping us... Um, at that point, you end up getting, you know, you, you, you reach the finish line, you realize they're both supposed to be very different, um, but they both get tied into the same knot. Um, and when, you know, we try to unravel that knot, and at the end of the rope, we just sort of see, oh, it's kind of just nothing. You know, it, there's that disappointment. It's it. kind of just there. Um, yeah, I, I like the, the what Shadowbringers did when you would do... Uh, for example, I'm trying to think of the uh, Lou Reek uh, when you're doing the the one of the the class quests, right? One of the role quests, uh, and you end up experiencing an echo, and he says, "Oh, do you do that all the time? That's kind of dangerous, right?" So you, you poke fun at it, and you have it in terms of a, a story beat that isn't just for the player to experience something. It's an actual physical, tangible plot device. And yet, when you actually show its origins, it sort of falls flat. There's that discomfort to it. So while I think that there's room to grow from this, um, I don't think it's 100% done. If it is done, then, you know, there's there's my disappointment. Um, I Like I said earlier, I'm kind of in the wait and see, but I'm just sort of, you know, sitting down, waiting for somebody to tell me to to get back up. There's There's always room to learn more and and for right now i'm kind of just sitting down yeah you're right there is always room to learn more but what really gets my goat is that like you had entire factions in aorzia dedicated to researching the echo and then the first person that helps us or tries to teach us how to use the echo isn't even one of these groups it's vana at in endwalker 10 years later <laughs> telling us <laughs> Oh, you've been trying to... Uh, you don't know how to use that, do you? Here, let me help. It's like, really? Only now someone is trying to help us uh, learn this power? <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a point in the story where there's so many other things going on that it, it, it was put on the back burner. And now I constantly think of that moment and how little significance it had. Um, you know, it was like, oh, go to this special tree with a special flower and all these sort of things in Elpis. But Elpis as a whole with the story 
while while we're in there is is so interesting all these characters we're seeing all these new characters all these new sides to them and the echo while it is almost extremely pivotal to why our characters even start this journey it's just surrounded by by these titans of story arcs uh and and so i would love for us to see more but yeah until we do then then i'm just sort of sitting there like i said disappointed um but you know i'm holding on to the copium so we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> see the echo the echo is such a fun little thing because i mean i think for the most part it's definitely meant to be some sort of deus ex machina you know, oh, one hundred percent. Kind of like the blessing of light as well. Right. The, yeah, they don't the want to ever one hundred percent find it. I don't think. Yeah, because no. then they lose. Yeah. They lose that ability to just. Oh, look! Narrative jump. No, know, exactly. Kind of Whenever the writers are like, "Uh, how do we move the plot forward?" Well, let's just give the yeah. warrior of light a vision. Boom. If they, done. if they do paint, yeah, if they do paint themselves in the corner, it's a nice way to get out of it. But the funny thing is, is, like, from day one, right, the Echo has always been a confusing thing because even for those that remember 1.0 or for those that played 1.0, the Echo allowed you to actually interact with the memories in the past and actually, like, the memories would, like, speak to you as if you were physically there in the past. And they never, ever, ever talk about that. No, ever. honestly, that was <laughs> one of the coolest things uh, about 1.0. And... Yeah, was that uh, you were going, you were actually back in the past interacting with the past and causing changes if i'm early, going to be completely honest future. i thought that's what they were going to do with elpis yeah i thought yeah. they were like bringing that back and like it was sort bringing of like a echo, supercharged echo, echo moment right but, but unfortunately <laughs> yeah but, but then it became all of that now don't get me wrong uh, Elpis was beautiful. Easily one of the right. most gorgeous zones I've seen in Final Fantasy XIV. Very well. And done. getting yeah. to see, like, the ancients' culture and, like, understand their philosophy, how they work and all that stuff, was amazing. Ultimately, mm -hmm. since we already know what happens to them in the plot, y you don't really get anything for the plot beyond personal enjoyment of learning what happened back then ultimately right. the only valuable knowledge we bring back to the present is oh medion was a thing essentially mm -hmm. and discovering the whole reason like because you were trying to figure out why fan daniel got the way he did you, and all that. one depressed guy created a depressed bird now the galaxy has cancer <laughs> great uh now that being said they've done a really good job and and it, like you guys have mentioned, I think it's a symptom of having so many balls to juggle at one point, especially mm -hmm. for one act of an expansion. Um, but, you know, we're still getting little things like the um, uh, like the raid series where we once again go back into the past and we're with uh, Themis and learning more about La Habrea. Super interesting stuff. Um, yeah, I'm actually really enjoying those portions of the patches. Really great stuff. The time travel paradoxes um, we've been creating are irritating. <laughs> I will never try to straighten those out because there is no straightening them out. No, there's I'm certain things that I'm there's travel. certain dots that will never be able to be connected, and and yeah. that's okay too. Um, you know, it's kind of like the situation with Asm. There, there, there needs to remain a certain amount of mystery to things to, you know, before people just are able to dissect it too much, and you know, you take yourself out of the experience. Um, mm -hmm. No, yeah, yeah, I've reached the point when it comes to just time paradoxes, just in stories, I mean, whether it's, you know, famous superhero media that goes through time and different anime and stories and children's books that all do time travel, they all do them differently. Um, I've never been a fan of it, but at the same time, I I try not to think too deeply about it, because uh, otherwise... I, I <laughs> and frustrated. you'll save more brain cells by not thinking too hard about it. Exactly. Someone can ask me a question about any sort of time paradox, and I'm like, sure. You know, because ultimately, the real world doesn't even have an answer. Uh, so it's just a fictional tool. Uh, I, I was going to say, I can be confused, frustrated, or happy whenever I think about any sort of time paradox. Uh, but ultimately, I'm just along for the ride, especially when it comes to this uh, the, the raid series, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm I'm here to see the characters. I I don't care about the time paradox. This could be happening at the same time in a different dimension. This could be happening in the future. The time paradox out of the question. I'm just here to see how the characters interact um, and what interesting stuff I can gather from there. Because yeah, otherwise I'm just going to be frustrated and and cry myself to sleep if I try to think too deeply about 
time paradox. The, <laughs> the only that thing that it irritates right. me about like time travel, the use of time travel and time paradoxes in stories, is because it feels like it's too easy of an out. And what I mean mm-hmm. by that is, let's say the writers put themselves into a corner. Oh well, we'll just use time travel to uh, d- get around this problem. And you can't say no because time travel is such an abstract and crazy concept you can't say it wouldn't work because it just does Uh, i think that's probably why the concept of the echo allowing you to interact with the past in 1.0 probably went to the wayside because it just allows for it it's too open And and you're right it becomes too easy it's a layup every single time um which is why i'm hoping that when we get done with this raid series we don't venture into the past anymore (laughs) <laughs> there's there's enough to sort out in the present that uh, we should go do that. And I, I talked about this on TikTok in response to uh, a comment earlier today. People were saying, well, whatever they do next won't be good because how do you contend with the threat of the end singer and, you know, the Asians and how do you how do you come back with something meaningful from that? Like presenting it like it's a dragon ball dilemma of how do you continue to power these characters up? And I don't think that has to be the case. You can do these nuanced ground level street level stories. uh, Then as long as you build an emotional connection to whatever is going on, uh, like shadow bringers did a great job showing us how, uh, the first is suffering by taking us inside these characters and their struggles. And a lot of them are, the little characters i'm not talking about the scions we experience that with them too but the little characters right. who have been the chai for family years and, yeah to build that connection and you can do that you can do that anywhere we go to Mis- uh, maricidia or whatever other piece of of the world that we haven't explored that's covered in clouds uh, and if you present <laughs> character with a meaningful problem and make it so it's it, in a way it can resonate with the audience then it can be successful it doesn't matter how big the threat is they can right. depower us however they want to, too. I am 100% in agreement with you on that. We don't mm-hmm. need another world-shattering event, which is kind of why I rolled my eyes a bit when the whole, like, void trying to invade the source became a thing. I'm like, really? We're going right back to world-threatening events this quickly? Can we... the, There's so many things to explore and experience. Right. <laughs> As the, I mean, uh... and- no, go ahead. Oh, you good? They uh, when they hinted at the the revolution issues in Corvos, because you know that was like one of the very ending parts of End Walker. We have two of the Scions say we're going to Corvos because something's going on over there. We want to check it out. I'm like, cool. Can we come with? Because like that's like that could be something as simple like just hey, let's let's figure how out how to help all shocking. these provinces in the emptiness of Garlemald fall. Like you know now that the empire has fallen. You have all these nations that just suddenly regained their autonomy. Why aren't we doing anything about that? How shocking I'm, would it yeah. have been <laughs> if we went to like a section of Corvus the same way we went to Whirlit? <laughs> but, I, but like, would, I would not like that strictly because... Uh, so, so when it comes to the Void, I, I'm a massive fan of the Void. I've always loved the spooky ghosties. Um, <laughs> you, you like know, the I demons? Whole, <laughs> I, I, I am a big fan of it, and so I, I really appreciate what we're doing with this. I would love to see some Gaia tie-ins, but that's just me. Um, but from there, I think, and what I hope, uh, we deal with the Void um, and sort of wrap it up and, and solve this in, in the 6.0 patches. Um, and so that allows us to go deal with these smaller threats and uh in in 7.0 let's say it's a corvosi um warlord right really simple really down to earth i would love to just experience that for a few patches you know um mm-hmm. you know we've talked about the the bozia quest lines and when it comes to, to stories you don't need something big and bad you can just have one person is really messed up in the head uh how do we fix that and i mean we can see that in in stormblood and while people have their own misgivings about stormblood I'm a huge fan about it because we can look on the ground. We can see what this grieving mother does for her son who's off to war. Or we can go see what this uh, magistrate does while they're kind of going insane over the grieving loss of their uh, loved one. And I, and I really appreciate those down-to-earth stories. I, I'm not a f- big fan of the quote-unquote uh giant mecha battles space battles you know while i do enjoy those for for me personally i've you know i've spoken to friends that absolutely love those they love the big giant galaxy threats uh i always love just as a as a psychology major i love the 
the picking the person's brain moment and and when right. you a people see person. that going forward i i very much am i mean i it's just my whole line of thinking is what is that individual person doing and what's their uh, life I, what's their story i i can like, respect that tremendously exactly exactly mm-hmm. i mean that's why i'm fun facts just grabbing some random npc that people forgot about and just giving you their life story you know no yeah you a know, lot of people were surprised when i told them that nashu was abused growing up and i'm like they're like this funny girl from the hildebrand quest i'm like yeah right people hate stormblood they, they hate it more than they should because it's not as bad as people like to give it credit for there's two real reasons people didn't like stormblood they didn't like xenos they didn't like the way he was executed in that expansion and they didn't really like lease either yeah there's a lot of i'm not saying that i don't because i i like xenos personally um but that's the reason that they kind of but you know they talk about it as if uh the patches between heavensward and a realm reborn up until the end were like bright shining gems uh they were not (laughs) honestly that's the thing people i think i would shock a lot of people if i was to rate all the expansions stormblood would actually be higher than i think people are expecting because not only was like it's so much fun seeing so many different places and cultures and people but the game also executed so many trials and raids very well in that expansion. I was so happy with Stormblood when it comes to just content. But I agree, that story gets a little more hate than it ever deserved. Now, was it kind of rushed? Yeah, honestly. The story was bifurcated, so you only got half the time in Doma and Alamigo that you would have had in something like Ishgard with the Heavensward story. And you, you can feel it, but no, it's a it's an entire thing. Hey, thanks so much for having me, guys. I really enjoyed getting to sit down and do this roundtable with you guys. Hopefully, we'll get to do it again here really soon. Uh, if you want to see character deep vibes, you can find me on YouTube. Uh, that's just Stout Helm. And uh, yeah, I love all the people in this call. You all do great work. It's like, so yeah, go check them out if you haven't already. I, I don't know. I always felt like I was this outlier because I really enjoyed Stormblood. I don't know if it was because of my it was technically my first expansion that I was fully present for from start to finish. That might have had uh, something to do with it. I also I also have this weird. So I, I I've always I always get these like thinking moments. Where, like I sit down and try to figure out why I like a certain things because you know that's that's the fun of it all is to, like critically think about your emotions or your impressions on certain stuff. And you know my my dad was in the military, right? So like. Stormblood was a very military heavy expansion because it's all about liberation, it's all about serving, it's all about that stuff. And I was like, man, I was getting all these vibes from, you know, the soldier experience. I was like, man, I like this, you know. <laughs> but but I think I think if there wasn't really any connection to the to the liberation aspect of the expansion, it fell very flat. Very hard to, <laughs> I to engage every- somebody who who didn't care to liberate, you know, a nation that they like if they didn't have that mentality of wanting to save these nations. That was literally the entire point of the expansion. So they probably just didn't really. They're like, "What's the? What am I doing?" Like, you're saving people. It's good, right? No. Mm-hmm. Every I time like, I hear someone <laughs> say Stormblood and Liberation, all I can think about is that one meme someone made where the Warrior of Light approaches Lise like, "I liberated this." You, oh yeah. You liberated this, <laughs> and then Lise is holding it. I liberated this. <laughs> I, I remember. I remember that meme. That was, oh my uh, god. Lise has gotten. I mean, I dedicate an entire video asking if people talking on lease is worth it. And honestly, I don't think it is. I think it's like, it's not worth it. But do I understand why people rag on her so much? Yeah, I totally see it. I agree. I I mean, when we we discussed earlier about benching characters, you know, um, you know, they've done a good job of, of introducing characters and being able to bench them, uh, if not for later, but maybe for for as long as we know right now right when you look at uh lease we ha- we had the whole revelation we had the whole expansion and then we let her do her thing right um mm-hmm. so while my opinion on lease is is generally positive it's more so because we just haven't gotten anything else there and i i sort of just let her vibe in her corner um i still do understand a lot of people's grievances uh, about her i just as you said you know is it worth my time at this point because we haven't really talked to lise at all for years at this point um you know we go back there say hi ask her for some some money and whatnot but <laughs> for, for for all intents and purposes you know there she's not in the story that much so hence 
she doesn't really derive very much opinion out of me. Uh, but it's the fact that that they've shown that they can say, all right, here's a character from, I mean, 1.0. Let's put her on the back burner for two expansions in a row, if not forever, uh, and introduce a new character, right? So so they've shown the propensity to be able to do that, and, I, and I'm excited to see what they do uh, in the future. So long as they're not replacing characters like Lise with characters like Zero, I'm happy. <laughs> Look, I my my biggest hang up about Zero is that she is like every middle schooler's fantasy character. Oh, I'm this dark, brooding, quiet type who's also very powerful and I don't want to tell you about my past and I don't believe in friendship, but maybe I do. Oh, did I also mention I'm half demon and no one else is? <laughs> And I, I have this that's... special power yeah. that everyone that no one else has. Like <laughs> it's just I can I can just imagine some kid doodling coming up with zero in class, and it's just like really this is the best you could do. What well, I mean, while zero is very much someone's deviant art OC brought to life, <laughs> uh, at the, at that point, is that not everyone's warrior lights, or at least a large chunk? I oh, mean, there's a large, many... yeah. Oh, true, large, but I don't have to experience characters. their warriors of light. I have <laughs> to <very> experience <laughs> zero. <laughs> that is that is very true. But like I said, I'm I'm a fan of of void sense. So I'm I'm a fan of the edgy. Uh, I'm a fan of the edgy person with the tilting hat and the dark armor, <laughs> half demonic. Um, you know, is she is she does she have a lot of depth? No. Um. But at the same time, I, I like her use. And for me, she sort of fits in the, the same corner that Estinian once did of dark, edgy person that was someone's deviant art OC and allows them to just sort of breathe and be edgy and have these really cool moments. Um, so while I don't expect any Estinian level grand story moment, I still am, I, I still do appreciate what she does um, and what she sort of does for the void uh, and in terms of survivors, humanoid people on the void um, or on the, on the shard and whatnot. And uh, I, it, she, she, she made me smile on the void. Yeah. I, I, if anything, I would want to provide the possibility that the whole emptiness that she gives off is just the idea of how she's never had a single opportunity to experience emotion for several years. Cause it, you know, time stops in the void, or at least time is not, you can't measure time in the void. So we don't know how long that, after the flood of darkness, how long have they been sitting in that perpetuity of, you know, not being able to die and all that nonsense and all the, all the various uh, the void issues that have been going on. And then now, like, because even, I, I don't know, if, do we want to talk about 6.3 spoilers now? Or the, We're, we've already the, spoiled so much, who cares? Fair, yeah, just one to make sure. Um, you know, because in 6.3, she experiences for the first time a desire to help somebody. And she's just like, what's going on? I remember like, this yeah. feeling. Yeah. She's like, what is this? Like, and I think, I think the idea that they're trying to express in the narrative is that she's encountering actual human emotions for the first time. And it's very difficult for her to put into words because she's never had it before. So it just makes it, you know, it, it is very flat in terms of what we understand because, we, you know, we're always present with emotion. And if she's never had it in the first place, probably an interesting way they're trying to explain it by being like, oh, yeah, so she can't, she didn't feel before, but now she's currently feeling. Mm -hmm. And then. True. I'll, I this, will give you that. That is 100% on the money with that. I, th one. I think that's what they're trying to do. But, uh, you know, this is also me coming from the, the Kingdom Hearts experience. Oh, Ocean God, we're not Pies. talking about that here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my Lord. There's no saving I, that story. I've, I've done an entire... I've, I've, I've encountered and lived through an entire storyline that was based on the idea of lack of emotion. So I'm like, I get it. I get what they're trying to do, you know? <laughs> but, um, but while we're talking about the Void, and Void Scent in particular, there's one thing that uh, has got uh, myself and a few other people confused. Uh, and I'd like to get uh, the takes from you both here uh, mm -hmm. while we're sitting here talking. And that is the nature of Void Scent and their essence. For the longest time, oh, yeah. we have essentially been told that when a Void Scent dies on the source, their essence returns to the 13th 100% of the time. And that's because like little Void Scent have 
come over for thousands, literally thousands of years have been coming over to the source and yet things have never been off kilter. Their souls go back to the 13th, they respawn, they invade again. And some of the Void Sent even uh, you meet in Zero's Domain even confess about their time in the Source. So why was it that suddenly, out of nowhere, Cognazzo and Rubicante are assumed to suddenly be part of the Source? That feels like a very strange addition. So what are your two right. thoughts? I want to say that if if the previous knowledge that because this this is one thing they've done several times in the past to kind of save themselves because they're, they're I, I think the writers or at least the the foundational storytelling and the storytellers behind that are aware that they're this game is going to be or at least they want it to last for a very long time right we they were talking about another 10 years to go Jesus. and so yeah, yeah, right. Imagine, like, we can't even imagine how twenty how years much of storytelling. And, good luck. Yeah, it's, it's crazy, right? Um, but to keep it to keep it going, right? They've implemented sort of like stop checks. I guess it would be the best term for it. One of those is that you know the source and the people on the source think they know everything, but they don't. Uh, mm. They tend to. They have a very limited knowledge base. Koji has said about what fifty percent of the local population can read, and most of them can't uh you know there's various things he's done where he's like he's they don't have a like, centralized well, education system yeah. in yeah. Yeah. exactly and there's no there's no good communication processes information travels very slowly in this world and so what i want to say is that maybe they have thought that that's how it worked and we're about to get a whole boom really reality check oh this is actually how it works in the next patch or so uh i do want them to address it that would be awesome if they bring it up, like someone who asks the question in game and be like, okay, well, we thought this is what it was supposed to be. What's going on? And then we find out, oh, whoops, we actually didn't know this is how it actually is. And honestly, that's all we really need. Just a little yeah, bit of that's... like clarification that says something like, well, it turns out that some of the souls did in fact stay part of the source and maybe that's why the ethereal realm is so fucky sometimes or they can even say that the souls like did join the live stream and is now messing it up and then that's the latter half of the story or something. exactly maybe like that's we, an expansion saying like look we need to go help this place because we, we, gotta, we gotta fix is... the live stream uh-huh <laughs> and oh hey here we go uh hydland's gone the live stream's getting messed up because we threw some void souls in the way and Mirac city has the answer there. Boom. I just <laughs> done. We we've just written an we entire expansion. Story. Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> we we go to Morass City to fix the live stream. Yeah, I don't know, something like that. No, yeah. Yeah, I I mean there's a there's a lot of things that they can do with the void. I mean, not only like I said, would I like to see any sort of Gaia Reen Eden tie ins, just because, you know, that's one of the ways to fix uh the void, but then you also have um, maybe we grab some mages from the first and what they know about the void, you know, because they have right. to try really hard to pull things over on that side while we get them by accident, right? You can yeah. go out into the woods and find a void. And scent. at the end um, of the, like the group uh, job quests, you even mm -hmm. like get confirmation from the NPCs that they're going to start researching the 13th and maybe try mm -hmm. to find ways to save it in a similar way to how they saved the first. Yeah. Exactly. That Right. That was we, a recent we, update, actually. They, you can actually talk to those NPCs, and I've I've noticed they'll update them, which is really cool. But they mentioned that they, when you talk to them and you tell them, I've been to the thirteenth recently, and we're actually trying to fix it on our side. They're like, hey, cool, we're trying to do it too on our side. And they did mention that they were going to consult who, you know, the people that worked on fixing the, the first. That's it. That's all we got. So I'm like, well, maybe, at least they're acknowledging it, you know. But yeah. Exactly. When you go to Sayela and, and, and Uno Kauhai and the rest of them and say, hey, we just mm -hmm. met a memorial, they're like, oh, wow, that's crazy. You know, there weren't a lot of them, but we did know about them. We just didn't think that any of them were alive. So that's why we never brought it up. Right. That's a story reason for saying that they just created that for that expansion. Exactly. Right? <laughs> right? It's like, but, look, we but, didn't come uh, up with this yet, but hey, nice to know you met them. <laughs> Right. I, right. And, and, you know, that's that's what I appreciate because they're at least able to say, you know, hey, we just made this thing up. But here's why that these other characters never brought it up. Um, so you can add on things, you know, if they would have said, oh, the the memoriates were, you know, 95 percent of our population, you know, that would have been a bigger 
why didn't you guys ever mention this, right? But they're like, oh, right. you know, it's not crazy, but awesome. Uh, you know, we met one, you know, so that way we, we can maybe experience more, but it's not totally likely at the same time. Uh, so, that, you know, it saves them. That's their cushion, right, in terms of writing. Uh, and, I, and I really... Go ahead. I have to give them credit for... Because, you know, you're talking about the cushions in the writing, and it reminded me of how we understood the whole void issue to have resulted back because Unakalhai was the first one to explain it, right? And he used the word Arasite, right? And you actually get to ask Zero at one point in the quest line, you know, I thought it was called Arasite. And uh, <laughs> she's like, what? <laughs> like, no, it's Memoria. Oh and my god. <laughs> they actually, like, they, they mentioned the possibility of it having a different name on the source, and that killed me. I was laughing at that part because I was like, "So you guys knew you wrote it differently? No, exactly. You still change the name, and you then you make it. You make a, a character make a remark about it in the character dialogue. I'm like, that, the I'm, moment I'm you catch the it, writers but... <laughs> mid changing their mind, it's like, right? It's so glorious when you see it happen. <laughs> oh, so man. yeah. No, what what you were saying about the the comfort or the the, the cushions, I think they they do have to have the stop gaps just in case of you know changes later on the line, you know, because um we brought I think we we talked about it earlier about you know did they foresee this or this is how it was supposed to be back then they were hinting at it all along, the devs don't write things out so far in advance everything that we know now they had two years earlier. Right, so Endwalker was starting to be constructed at the end of Shadowbringers, and so on and so forth. So we can generally have an idea of what they have ahead of schedule based on that timeline. Also, putting in the pandemic that knocked out a lot of you know their usual structuring. Which I mean, I mean, we got the Endwalker delays because of that. We don't know how much the pandemic has affected that specific way, but for the most part, what they know is two years ahead of us. So there's not a lot of like you know future planning and not a lot of like stuff where it's like oh we we were planning this since you know 1.0 it's like no no they're 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 making a lot of stuff up as they go. I feel <laughs> like that's a l amazing segue to the last topic, uh, which eventually leads into what we hope to see in the future for Final Fantasy XIV, right? And that is Dynamis. It was <laughs> introduced into Endwalker. It right. more or less kind of introduces a brand new energy type that no one ever heard, talked about, or even knew existed until now. Even members of the Convocation 14 did not know this energy know existed, which right. is huge. Mm -hmm. And yet at the same end, while it did play a pivotal role in creating Ultima Thule and everything... I feel like the writers have kind of written themselves into a corner when it comes to Dynamis, because like you said, they don't plan these things too far ahead. You have a lot of players mm -hmm. that think to themselves, oh, well, Dynamis has been in the works for years and all these references, and you think to yourself, well, Dynamis is more or less the power of friendship made manifest. <laughs> so, like, it's no different than an episode of My Little Pony. So, come on. <laughs> but uh, the, my point is, I hope... It isn't just a plot hole, or I suppose right. I should say a plot device used to push Endwalker forward, because that would be disappointing. I want to see Dynamis come back, but in a way that makes sense with the lore they've provided. They've gone on record now in the MSQ saying that Dynamis is so much weaker than Aether uh, in our world that you won't see it uh meaningfully interact with anything ever that's how dynamis could fly under the radar for thousands of years and never be noticed or seen right and that's the entire point everyone assumed everything was a theory a, uh, like based on aether because all they ever saw was aether being used consumed and yada 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 and no the end singer saying Dynamis once during a trial, ladies and gentlemen, does not suddenly undo a whole bunch of Aether lore. Stop it. I wanna say I wanna say Dynamis. Dynamis might get better context with the myths of the twelve raid, uh, because they brought that up in the last in, in, in Euphrazine's introduction. They mentioned it. 
And so I'm like, okay, cool. Here's a, here's the time. Here's here's the place you can talk more about it in this particular quest direction. Explain to us how it works, and then you know, give us a little bit more understanding of it. But like you said, nobody knew about this thing, and the people that found out about it, right? Because they were, I think it was what Hermes mentioned it, and then you know, Hades was like, wait, what? What is this? exactly? Hermes mentioned you failed that. to. You failed to mention to the convocation that this whole entire new power source exists. And not to mention, they got their memories wiped. So, like, literally the only people that know about this thing is you, Vina, and and the end sinker. Exactly. And some if Dynamis was important, if Dynamis was powerful, someone would have found out about it over the course of these thousands of years. And yet no right. one did. Would, no one did. Which and... means it was never that strong or important in the first place. No, nah, it only. I, I think it only existed as a way to help us combat the the idea. It it was on the themes of hope and despair, which is you know the general idea of that end part of the quest. Line. <laughs> the like, the crux there, of the Heidelin and Zodiac there, saga. Yeah, right. Is is there any point to anything? Right. Versus yes, there's a point to things, and then you know it's 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 the typical philosophical debate that. You know, people have had that's that's what the that's what it was for. It was to help give for, you know form and function to the idea. But I don't think it's meant to be this like you know catch all. It's not sudden world to be changing new, new Deus Ex Machina. Yeah, it's no. you know all yeah. of a sudden like we save everything with Dynamis. I don't think that's what it's supposed to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the thing about Dynamis when I first heard it, you know, as a as a nerd myself, the second I heard it, I said, "Oh wait, this is dark matter." Right. (laughs) For for anyone that's unfamiliar with it, you have a lot of matter in the universe, but you have even more dark matter, right? Right. And while dark matter is out in space, it's more so something that helps uh, uh, physicists finish equations, right? They can account for it, but you can't. It's really hard to measure it. And and Dynamis is very much the same thing, where like you can account for it in your physics equations, but you know, you're never going to look at it, point at this thing and say, oh, hey, look, that's dark matter, right? The average person's not going to be able to do that. And so while for the purposes of the end of Endwalker, when we're physically out in the middle of space... And On a planet eight, or in a realm that's purely made of the stuff, by the way. Exactly. <laughs> right. We're able to use it, physically see it, touch it, interact with it, etc. But for all intents and purposes, when we're on a single planet or a single shard or what have you, you know, we're going to be touching Aether. That's what we're going to be interacting with. That's what we're going to have. And like I said earlier, when it comes to, to limit breaks and the power of friendship and whatnot, these are things that are just intangible. These are writing devices. These are plot devices. I mean, limit break was something used to sell the game. And while we do have, you know, lore reasons as to what they are, it's very rarely going to be oh, this is what Limit Break is. It's very rarely going to be, oh, it has to be this. It's just going to be something that the devs have in the story and they're not, and they're never going to give us an answer for it. They don't want to. And I, and I doubt they ever will, mm-hmm. right? You know, it's like, you know, are, are they going to give us a little reason why we can use the, the duty finder, uh, you know, and change our eye level? I mean, eye level is not something that the devs are ever going to sit there and make a lore reason for. Well, right? they you know, gave us an excuse as to how we're able to yank people to our side in the middle of trials. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's fair, but yes. And but granted, that that's something that I wish to see change in the future, but that's a whole separate tangent. Um, but but <laughs> like I said, looking forward into the future, when it comes to Dynamis, I would like to see... Um, I, I would like it to stay in a sort of power of friendship role, very, very, very niche way off in the side and i like a lot more of the things that we can see a lot of the things that we can actually touch to be aether based and see how we can interact with it um because for all intents and purposes the dynamis was used as a singular threat it was a wave there's a shell of aether all this Z- zodiac stuff that we we're able to account for but that threat's gone now and you know we have new threats like i said i want to stick down to the ground i want to deal with the random corvosi warlord or the Maricidian, you know ancient dragon demon that we have to kill but in terms of you know the big threat of dynamis i don't think we'll be seeing that for a very long time if at all 
Honestly, I am 100% in agreement. I don't mm-hmm. expect us to ever see Dynamis make such a huge return like Endwalker did with Ultima Thule. You can't even compare Ultima Thule to the Source. They are two completely different locations with different energies and everything. But I think you're on the money. I want to see us explore like places right next door to Eorzea. I want to see us explore like Maricidia, parts of uh, on the map that I can see, but we haven't been to yet. And if they want to use things like Dynamis and the Void and other shards to try and uplift those stories, I will be more than happy to see what they have in store for us. I yeah, I just I mean, in terms of why it exists and what it did for us, I followed it in the context of Endwalker and Endwalker only. You know, I don't. I, I guess personally, as and for my own enjoyment, and then just playing the game and and getting invested in its world building and story, I don't find it necessary. You know what I mean? Like it's not something. that's like, oh, I need to know what Dynamis is so I can figure it out and use it or talk about it. And it's just like it was there to explain the Endwalker plot, and it made sense in the Endwalker plot, and it was cool in the Endwalker plot. You know what I mean? <laughs> but like, what 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 will it do for us in the future? You know, what will it do for the character? What will it do for the story? I mean, it just, it, it just, it was there for what it what was needed for. What will knowing that it exists do for us now? Exactly. Exactly. It doesn't have that. It's like, it, I want to know other things. I have other things to figure out. Like, tell me about those things first. And then, and then I'll, let's see if I'm still thinking about like that. Like the heart of Sadiq. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my god, that <laughs> we could do a whole we... podcast about that. Honestly, and I suppose that is a good note to end on since we've been at this for a little bit more than an hour, and some of us do have uh, other responsibilities. Yeah, that, was, that was a great way to end and stout, it. And Stout Helm unfortunately had to leave us early, but I'm so glad that I was able to get Croton and Final Fantasy 14 Fun Facts to hang out with us today and just share our thoughts. I want to do more things like this in the future, like I said, with other lore pers- uh, people. Of course, I only just reached out and grabbed you guys as quickly as I could because I'm like, okay, I talk to, to them regularly, so maybe I can get them as quick as I can. But hopefully we can get more people involved in the future. And I would love to see that because these talks, I think, <clears throat> are what enrich uh, the lore community for a game like Final Fantasy XIV. I am the Synodic Scribe. One of your many lore lovers for this MMO and myself and my friends here are looking very much forward to what we all get to experience in the future moving forward. Thank you so much for staying with us. And as always, stay safe, my friends.